Good morning. Thank you all for joining the live stream. And thanks to those of you who will watch uh, the recording of this at your convenience. Uh, I am Michael Strain, Director of Economic Policy Studies here at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, and thank you for joining us uh, for Federal Reserve Governor Randall Quarles' final speech while at the Fed. Uh, Governor Quarles will discuss the Fed's supervision uh, and regulatory functions. The uh, uh, plan for the hour is, is quite straightforward. Uh, Governor Quarles will uh, deliver uh, his speech, deliver his remarks. Uh, following that, uh, he and I will have a conversation uh, both about the topic of the speech and also about uh, broader monetary policy and economic issues. Uh, and we will uh, be happy to take questions from the audience. You can submit those questions uh, via email to mariana.mitchell at aei.org. Uh, the spelling of that email address is on the webpage for this event. Uh, and uh, you can also submit questions uh, via Twitter using the hashtag uh, at AEIECON. Uh, let me uh, introduce Governor Quarles. Randall K. Quarles took office as a member of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System on October 13th, 2017. He was vice chair for supervision from October 2017 until October of 2021. Governor Quarles is also the chair of the Financial Stability Board, an international body that monitors and makes recommendations about the global financial system. Prior to his appointment to the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, uh, Mr. Quarles was founder and managing director of the Sinisher Group, a Utah-based investment firm, before founding that firm, he was a partner at the Carlisle Group. Previously, he served as Undersecretary of the Treasury for Domestic Finance, as Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for International Affairs, as Policy Chair of the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, and as the U.S. Executive Director of the International Monetary Fund. He holds a bachelor's degree from Columbia and a law degree from the Yale Law School, and this is his last month uh, on the Board of Governors. Uh, Governor Quarles, thank you so much for uh, being here today. Thank you for uh, 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 sharing your remarks uh, with us and, and with our audience. Uh, and let me turn over the microphone to you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, uh, so you noted that I uh, joined the Board of Governors uh, uh, four years ago uh, as Vice Chair for Supervision. And when I uh, when I walked through the doors of the Eccles building in that post, the Fed was in the latter stages of a, of a decade-long effort to build a new financial regulatory framework uh, in answer to the financial crisis of 2008. Uh, and yet, uh, even though the mortar wasn't yet dry uh, on that construction project, uh, you know, there was a blueprint created by Congress and central banks and supervisors around the world. And and much work in implementing that blueprint, there was already, even at that point, broad recognition across the political spectrum that the framework uh, could be improved on based on the experience of how it had worked over the decade of its first implementation. That was the judgment of the authors of the post-crisis blueprint, former Senator Chris Dodd, former Congressman Barney Frank. Uh, it was the, also the recommendation of one of my predecessors at the Fed, Dan Cerullo, who uh, was also a principal architect of this framework. Uh, and in his final speech as a Fed governor, uh, he proposed uh, several significant changes. So I came to the Fed uh, in order to take on that task of making the system better, more simple, more efficient, more transparent. Uh, Congress also took up that effort uh, in the broadly bipartisan Economic Growth Regulatory Relief and Consumer Protection Act. Uh, and we adjusted our regulatory framework to better align our requirements with the risk that was posed by uh, firms to the financial system. We maintained, uh, in fact, in important respects, we raised regulatory standards, certainly capital standards for the most systemically important firms and simplified regulatory requirements for smaller firms without diminishing the resilience of the system as a whole. And then in the midst of our work to improve the framework, uh, we faced the COVID event, uh, which tested that resilience. Uh, it was a real life stress test uh, that demanded emergency action. Uh, 
both with respect to the regulatory framework and more broadly, including through the establishment of 13 emergency lending facilities uh, in our role as lender of last resort to stabilize the financial system. Uh, and so now, as my tenure as a member of the board comes to a close, uh, I'd like to use this final speech to discuss issues that my successor and his or her colleagues uh, will inevitably confront. Areas of uh, unfinished business. Uh, in the near term, uh, there will need to be further refinements to the bank supervisor and regulatory framework based on the continuing accumulation of evidence and experience on how these ideas and rules and procedures have worked in practice. In the longer term, I think the Fed will at some point need to grapple with the implications of some of the novel emergency lending facilities we established during the onset of the COVID event. Uh, I supported those facilities in light of the specific challenges the country faced during that grueling spring. Uh, but I do believe it's possible to draw some lessons from the experience and set out some principles for the Fed's emergency lending to prevent that precedent or some vision of what that precedent represents from exceeding reasonable bounds in the future. Uh, and finally, in my capacity as the outgoing chairman of the Financial Stability Board, I have some reflections on the upcoming agenda for the, for the FSB. Now, uh, there's a, a full text uh, of this speech uh, that we have put up on the website uh, for perusal to stand uh, alongside the Bhagavad Gita uh, and uh, T.S. Eliot's four quartets. Um, it would uh, not take more than uh, three or four hours to read, uh, but um, I, will, uh, I will spare uh, the folks listening today uh, that, that full text. I would note uh, that uh, Dan Trullo's final speech as an outgoing Fed governor uh, ran to 26 pages. This runs to 25, uh, uh, which I think is consistent with my relentless drive to improve the efficiency and simplicity of the Fed's practices. Um, uh, so, uh, so today, before turning to Q&A, I'll uh, pick some of the highlights uh, of what I've, I've wanted to say in this reflection on some of the challenges that we'll, that we'll face in the future. Um, I begin by saying that the, uh, you know, that I think the post-crisis regulatory framework with the myriad uh, refinements that we have made to it over the course of the last four years is strong. And I think that's evidenced by how well it fared against a severe real life stress test, COVID. Uh, banks entered the COVID event with high levels of capital and liquidity. They served as a source of strength to the economy uh, in a time of need. Uh, some have tried to argue that uh, COVID wasn't a true test of the system uh, because of the unprecedented level of fiscal support, Federal Reserve support that was provided to the real economy during that time. And, and the financial system, the banks uh, obviously indirectly benefited from uh, that economic support. I think that argument ignores though that the Federal Reserve certainly didn't take that support for granted uh, during the throes of the crisis itself. So we were running multiple stress tests throughout the COVID event, three separate and distinct scenarios, along with a sensitivity analysis that had three additional uh, hypothetical recessions. And each of those analyses assumed no additional fiscal or other measures to support the economy. Uh, and the, this relentless stress testing of the system uh, uh, during the period of stress demonstrated that even without that support, the banking industry would have fared very well. Uh, so in my view, the resilience uh, of the banks during the COVID event, coupled with the results of our stress tests, demonstrate that the overall level of capital in the banking system is, is more uh, than ample. Um, but uh, we um, uh, inevitably, there is more work to be done. Our regulatory and supervisory framework is strong, uh, but there are further refinements that could be made to improve the framework. The number of them were on my agenda uh, when the COVID event shifted our focus to deal with the emergency. And so, although I'm, I'm proud of what we accomplished in my time, there's more to be done. And one of the principal matters that the Fed will have to take up in the very near term is the calibration of our leverage capital standards. 
So I, I'm sure anyone who's uh, uh, listening to this is not listening unless they are quite familiar with the fact that our capital framework includes two types of requirements, risk-based and leverage capital requirements. Risk-based requirements are risk sensitive. They change depending on the riskiness of an asset. Leverage capital requirements set a minimum floor for required capital by disregarding risk sensitivity measures. And our capital framework includes two leverage requirements with increasingly strict requirements for the largest institutions. Uh, now, while the leverage ratio is an important backstop, it can obviously result in perverse incentives if it becomes the primary constraint on a bank's investment decisions. Since a leverage ratio isn't sensitive to risk, a firm that is bound by such a ratio has an incentive to avoid adding safe assets to its portfolio. Uh, it has to pay the same capital charge on those assets and it won't earn uh, as high a return. In addition, during times of stress in the financial system, when it's most important for banks to be able to continue serving businesses and households or continue intermediating transactions, a binding leverage constraint, even one that threatens to become binding, can discourage banks from engaging in safe activities such as those involving US Treasury securities. Now, that's not to say that a leverage requirement should never be the constraining requirement for a firm. In times of stress, a leverage ratio can be a transparent measure of capital uh, when our risk weights may be called into question. Uh, in addition, it guards against uh, behavior by a supervised institution to gain those risk weights. Uh, and finally, a leverage ratio leans against the inherent tendency of bank leverage to increase in an economic boom and fall during a recession. What we're seeing today though, is that supervised firms are increasingly being constrained by the supplemental leverage ratio, not for any of these valid reasons, but simply because of a rise in the level of safe assets in the U US financial system. The supplementary leverage ratio was originally calibrated for a financial system with a far lower level of central bank reserves and a much smaller treasury market. The current environment is of course much different. Treasury issuance is at an all time high. The banking system is awash with central bank reserves. To provide some context to the degree of this trend, for the largest banks, the amount of reserves they hold is $1.35 trillion. The amount of treasury securities they hold is $1.38 trillion. Each of that is roughly double the amount they held when that supplemental leverage ratio rule was finalized uh, and initially calibrated. And even at these, those lower levels of safe assets uh, in 2014, some on the board worried that the SLR might be too tightly calibrated even then, but they took comfort from the staff's projection that reserves in the system were likely to fall, creating more elbow room within the envelope created by the SLR. Uh, in fact, when we finalized our leverage requirements for the largest banks, staff projected that the amount of reserves in the system would decline to $25 billion by year end 2021. Well, it's year end 2021 and the current total of approximately $4.16 trillion in reserves is about 165 times that amount. So during COVID, as, as uh, again, everyone uh, who observes these issues is familiar with, we took emergency action to exclude US Treasury securities and deposits at Federal Reserve Banks from the supplemental leverage ratio to give banks additional flexibility to act as financial intermediaries during that time of stress. That exclusion expired uh, at the end of March of this year. And I supported that expiration, but with the commitment that the Fed develop a longer term solution to the perverse implications of the current calibration of the SLR. Uh, with respect to the enhanced supplemental leverage ratio that applies uh, to our largest banks, the, the GSIBs, the globally systemically important banks, uh, the best way to address this problem is the approach that's been endorsed by the Basel Committee. Recalibrating the fixed 2% ESLR buffer requirement to equal 50% of the applicable GSIB capital surcharge with corresponding recalibration at the bank level. That's an approach that was previously proposed by the board and the OCC, never finally implemented. That approach is preferable to other options, other options such as excluding central bank reserves or US treasury securities or both from the ratios denominator. So if we exclude central bank reserves from the denominator uh, and only central bank reserves, not treasury securities, 
that would exacerbate a structural preference for reserves over treasuries and bank portfolios that could have perverse consequences for the operation of the treasury market as we saw in September of 2019. But if we try to reduce that preference by excluding both reserves and treasuries from the denominator, that could result in a significant lowering of capital levels. Um, uh, and it could exacerbate the incentive for the banking system to prefer funding the government to funding private enterprise. And if we were to attempt to offset that lowering of capital levels by increasing the leverage capital requirement on non-excluded assets, that disincentive to fund private enterprise would only go stronger. Um, but whatever the form of the adjustment uh, among all of these options, this issue needs to be addressed. The overcalibration of our supplemental leverage ratio needs to be addressed to ensure that our capital framework doesn't lead to increased risk-taking and reduced safe asset intermediation. As it stands, we are driving deposits out of the highly regulated banking system and requiring that cash be held in other less stable parts of the financial sector, such as money market funds. And if we enter another crisis with this issue unaddressed, uh, the leverage ratio fundamentalists uh, will have much to answer for. Uh, now I have, uh, you know, there are a lot of other aspects uh, of our uh, regulatory framework uh, that I think uh, deserve attention in the, in the immediate term uh, by a newly incoming vice chair for supervision. Uh, uh, but I, I think I want to turn now, I, but all of that's on the web uh, for uh, perusal in the, uh, in the dark hours of the night. Uh, I think I want to turn uh, in this oral discussion uh, to some uh, issues that will be a longer term challenge. And by that, I mean the implications of our emergency actions in the recent crisis. The COVID event caused an unprecedented, indeed an unimagined shutdown of economic activity in the United States and much of the world. The Federal Reserve responded with the same vigor it showed when the great financial crisis threatened a worldwide depression, employing our ample emergency power under section 13.3 of the Federal Reserve Act to stabilize the economy and the financial system. And in that case, we reactivated forms of the lending facilities that we employed during the great financial crisis. And then we went farther to create new lending facilities to support households, businesses, state and local government entities that we feared would be frozen out of credit markets given the particular special circumstances in the spring of 2020. In all, the Federal Reserve created 13 lending facilities with the statutorily required approval of the Secretary of the Treasury. And I supported those actions and still do as the right response when faced with the specific challenges we faced in the spring of 2020. But I did at the time, and still do, have concerns about the possible precedents that have been created by those novel facilities that we implemented. Uh, it starts with a distinction between liquidity facilities, which are designed to bolster market functioning uh, by providing short-term loans to financial firms when that credit is suddenly not available, uh, and what I'd call credit facilities, which support the extension of long-term credit to the real economy, households, businesses, governments. The two different types of facilities have materially different characteristics. The liquidity facilities are largely wholesale. The, that is to say the term of the, uh, uh, by wholesale, I mean that they're, they're um, uh, aimed at improving the operation of wholesale financial markets. Um, the term of the funding they offer is generally quite short. Operating them calls on expertise that the Fed staff either has or that's very similar to uh, existing expertise we have. The risk of loss is minimal given the nature of the facilities. Withdrawing from them is relatively straightforward. We either sell the assets, let them mature. That happens relatively quickly given the short term and the penalty rate of the funding. The credit facilities, by contrast, uh, I, I call them largely retail. You can uh, you can quibble about whether that's the right adjective, uh, but I mean that they're uh, designed to provide longer term credit directly to non-financial actors or to financial firms for the sole purpose of on-lending to non-financial actors. The end users of the credit support are households, businesses, governments, they, at the, and, and those end users attract significant political interest, meaning pressure uh, 
for continued expansion of credit will be great. The credit facilities involve longer term lending. Operating the credit facilities requires expertise that we don't really have. That's not highly analogous to existing Fed expertise. The potential for troubled loans and thus potential loss is material, which also requires expertise and administrative attention that we're ill-suited to provide. The, the penalty rate needed for 13.3 lending can reduce the effectiveness of these facilities uh, and encounter significant political opposition uh, given the purpose of the credit support and withdrawing from the facilities will involve telling specific beneficiaries that their funding will not be extended, which is another politically fraught event. Uh, equally important, from outside the technocratic halls of the Fed, there will emerge from many directions persistent political pressure to pursue through the ostensibly monetary mechanism of emergency central bank lending, fiscal policy objectives that ought as a matter of fundamental economics and fundamental governance to be decided upon by elected representatives operating within the budgetary constraints of the appropriations process. As a prospective shortcut around those constraints, extended provision of credit to broad sections of the economy through the mechanism of 13.3, without either a required appropriation or effective limit, could easily prove an impossible lure for future Congresses to resist under the guise of one emergency or another. Having established the precedent that the Fed can, that the Fed can lend to businesses and municipalities for the COVID event, there will inevitably be those whose plans are grand and whose patience with democratic accountability low who will begin to ask why the Fed can't fund repairs of the country's aging infrastructure or finance the building of a border wall or purchase trillions of dollars of green energy bonds or underwrite the colonization of Mars. An entity that can do that without any need for congressional appropriations would have the vastest political consequence and political control of it would be a great prize. It would encourage dangerous fiscal irresponsibility and the attendant pressures would turn us from a technocratic non-political institution with a crucial but focused mandate and great autonomy in the pursuit of that mandate into the most politically entangled organization in the country and the damage to our core monetary policy and financial regulatory mission would be great. Fortunately, there were no major problems with the COVID credit facilities. While political pressure related to the credit facilities waxed and waned, the economy recovered quickly enough that the facilities could be wound down within several months with relatively little opera. Uh, but those good outcomes had more to do with good luck than good structure. Uh, while the economy and the financial system were under intense stress for several months in the spring of 2020, the reopening of the economy and the rapid recovery that began in May of that year was a major reason that material losses, political pressures, operational problems were avoided. Uh, we can't undo the precedent we've established. And I should stress that I don't believe we should undo the precedent. If we face a similar challenge in the future, the Fed should respond forcefully. But in breaching the long unbreachable firewall of offering direct lending to non-financial businesses, both large and small, as well as a wide range of state and municipal governments, we face a fundamental problem. The extension of funds to these borrowers and the management of these loans inherently involve the allocation of credit, which is both a fiscal and a political action that is being made primarily by an unelected body. For all these reasons, I believe we should establish a clear understanding that should the Fed ever again use its 13.3 authority to establish credit facilities, I'm not talking about liquidity facilities here, but credit facilities similar to those of the COVID event, Congress will without delay create a structure to transfer the ongoing funding and governance of the credit facilities into a non-Fed vehicle, a separate entity that will fund, manage, and eventually wind down the extraordinary credit support. Section 13.3, creates a standing power of the Fed to act rapidly and forcefully to address a crisis. That is a useful power. 13.3 allows the nature of that response to be flexible, depending on the nature of the crisis. Financial market dysfunction can be addressed through 13.3 liquidity facilities that fit comfortably within the Fed's operation and expertise, in many cases might not require any use of treasury equity or other congressionally appropriated funds. But if the shock is one like the COVID event, that requires real economy credit support to address its root causes. The Fed can use 13.3 to provide the same rapid and forceful response, but we should establish the expectation that this credit support will be moved into a separate non-Fed structure as quickly as Congress can manage. In the same way that the 13.3 facilities developed in 2008 served as templates in 2020, greatly increasing the speed of our response, the template outlined here that we create for the future should ideally become the default expectation of Congress 
markets and the public, should the Fed ever again be called upon to provide credit facilities under 13.3. There are a lot of precedents for such approach, uh, such an approach during the Great Depression, for example, Congress created the Reconstruction Finance Corporation to provide emergency credit to the real economy, expressly steering clear of the problems that would naturally have been associated with using the Federal Reserve for such a purpose. The RFC had a limited life, separately appropriated capitalization, separate borrowing authority in order to fund direct lending to borrowers, uh, and separate uh, politically accountable governance. More recently, during the 1990s financial and economic crisis in Sweden, Norway, and Finland, uh, after initial stabilizing responses from their central banks, these countries established new governmental agencies outside their central banks to manage the broader continuing support program programs. Um, I'd stress that this would not be a U-turn from our decisive response to the COVID event, but simply the logical next step. In addition to providing clarity for the public as to what to expect in future crises, Adopting this model going forward could reduce concerns that a future Fed might have, that a forceful response could entangle it in difficult political problems. And that could help give a future Fed the freedom to determine what it believes is truly the right technocratic response to a particular future shock. An adoption of such a framework would also reduce the attraction of the Fed as a general purpose funder of credit intensive political projects. We would have established that the Piper will not only always have to be paid, but paid promptly. The framework uh, would give us an appropriate role to 13.3, consistent with the clear authority granted to us, but also consistent with what we've learned about the entanglement of central banks with fiscal policy and politics in the years since 13.3's enactment. We wouldn't be ignoring the credit support authority 13.3 gives us, but anchoring it in its appropriate emergency context. <clears throat> Let me finally end uh, with some, um, uh, uh, words on the uh, program of the FSB. Uh, as we're continuing to grapple uh, with some of these regulatory issues, the United States is obviously not alone. Around the world, financial authorities are reflecting on the lessons from the COVID event. Uh, my term as chair of the FSB ended just yesterday, uh, but there remains much to be done at the FSB. And one of the most important tasks is addressing the vulnerabilities related to non-bank financial intermediation or NBFI. That has been a critical focus of my chairmanship. It's reflected in the FSB's ambitious multi-year work plan to enhance NBFI resilience. Uh, one set of initiatives under the work plan focuses on specific risk factors that appear to have propagated stress, uh, including liquidity strains. We've made considerable progress. And as a first major deliverable, the FSB recently published policy proposals to address structural vulnerabilities in money market funds. But although we've made good progress so far, we can't lose momentum. Uh, in the aftermath of the 2008 crisis, the FSB did lose momentum on NBFI. We accomplished a great deal uh, on the bank regulatory framework, less uh, on the non-bank regulatory framework. Uh, and it's critical that jurisdictions now make meaningful progress in money market fund reforms, building on the FSB's policy propo uh, proposals. Um, uh, as chair of the FSB, I've had the opportunity uh, to work with brilliant and dedicated colleagues around the world. And I think that under the severe pressure of the COVID event, uh, we delivered true to our mandate uh, through cooperation, analytical rigor and broad engagement. As I said at the uh, 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 meeting of the heads of government at the G20 uh, in Rome at the end of October, uh, the financial system in this crisis was one thing that they did not need to worry about. Uh, and in part, that was because of the good work that the FSB has done over the course of the last decade and did in the throes of the COVID crisis. Uh, so I mentioned at the outset uh, that uh, Dan Trullo's final speech was 26 pages long. Uh, if you go to the web uh, and read what I've left out here, this may have felt like it was 26 pages long, uh, but there's a lot more uh, on the web. Uh, uh, and yet even at this Mahabharatan length, I have only hit the highlights of what my uh, successor will need to address. Uh, fortunately, he uh, or she uh, will benefit uh, from some of the same principal advantages that I've had over the last four years. The intellectual horsepower, the analytical rigor, and the disciplined expertise of the Federal Reserve staff. Those are powerful advantages indeed, even with so complex and sustained an agenda 
and I wish her or him well. Uh, Governor Qualls, thank you very much for those remarks. Um, let me uh, remind the audience that you are welcome to submit questions uh, for Governor Quarles to mariana.mitchell at aei.org, mariana.mitchell at aei.org. You can find her email address on the webpage for this event. You're also welcome to submit questions uh, via Twitter using the hashtag AskAEIEcon. That's AskAEIEcon. While the questions come rolling in, Governor Quarles, let me ask you about uh, emergency lending facilities during the pandemic, which was a, a major focus of, of, of your remarks. Let me ask specifically about the, the Main Street programs. Uh, you uh, discussed how you're concerned about the precedent that these, these programs might set while expressing your, your support uh, for the Fed's decision to enact them. Uh, and you laid out uh, some suggestions for how uh, similar programs might be, might be structured in the future should uh, the need for such programs arise again in the judgment of the Fed. Let me ask you uh, how you think uh, the Main Street program performed. There were, there were remarkably few uh, uh, dollars lent under that program. The uh, requirements to secure a loan under that program uh, looked a lot to me like the requirements that a, that a, that a, a borrower would face from a, from a commercial lender. Uh, how do you think about the structure of that program? Uh, how do you think the program performed? And would you care to comment on the Treasury Department's role in uh, your assessment of the structure of that program and the performance of the program? So, uh, so there's a lot there. I'll try to keep the answer to less than 45 minutes. Um, the, uh, 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 you know, so I think the Main Street Lending Program uh, I think it served its purpose. I think that uh, as with most of the facilities, the liquidity facilities and the credit facilities, we knew that from the financial crisis, it was reinforced from the great financial crisis, it was reinforced during COVID, uh, that you know, a significant uh, part of the benefit of the facilities comes simply from the announcement effect. Uh, it comes from uh, uh, sort of anchoring private sector confidence that there is, uh, that there is a backstop uh, if you will, or that there's a floor uh, uh, for where they think things might be falling, uh, and that you know gives the private sector confidence to uh, uh, to re-enter the market. And that happened with all of the facilities. I think that was a, uh, a a function of the effect of the Main Street facility. Um, I I do think that given the specific task that we were seeking to accomplish, the specific challenge that we faced, I would have, uh, had I been king of the world, uh, structured the Main Street facilities so that there was a, a, a greater possibility of the facilities incurring a loss. Uh, that really, that's the logic uh, of a Main Street facility. Uh, you've got the private sector that is worried that there may be uh, you know, a, a, uh, an unquantifiable loss uh, from lending to certain categories of borrowers. If we're going to step in, if the government's going to step in, we should in some way be willing to cushion that loss in order to change that uh, incentive. And we weren't really in the structure of the Main Street facility. Um, there was a lot of uh, concern about you know, the potential political consequences of taking a loss. Uh, that's one of the reasons why. Um, yeah, that's one of the reasons for my argument that uh, if we're, as an emergency response matter, creating these sorts of credit facilities, we should as quickly as possible move them into a framework that can make the political decision to take a loss. Um, that's not something that central banks. I mean, legally, it's very difficult for us to do. Uh, conceptually giving our purpose, that's very difficult for us to do. That's not the type of lending that we are created to incur, but there are situations that arise where that is uh, you know, an appropriate decision that a government can take. It just shouldn't be taken by the Federal Bank, but by the Federal, by the federal Reserve, by the Central Bank. So, uh, so I think that having some structure that would 
create a separate uh, governance mechanism that would allow the decision to be taken that given what needs to be accomplished here, we can lower the, the interest rate uh, that we're charging. We can uh, accept, we can structure the terms so that there's a greater possibility of loss. The RFC that I uh, described at the outset, uh, it originally was designed uh, similarly to the way we designed our Main Street lending facility. Uh, but it had a mechanism to say, that's not working. Given the challenge that we're facing today, we need to make a different decision. And that decision could be made by people who are democratically accountable uh, in an immediate fashion in a way that the Federal Reserve is not. So uh, Governor Quarles, you're, I think you're appropriately concerned about the, the Fed's uh, status as an unelected body. You're appropriately concerned about Fed independence. You're appropriately concerned about Making sure that the Fed doesn't slip into fiscal policy uh, and, uh, and and sticks in its monetary policy lane, um, but revisiting the Main Street program, Congress appropriated around half a trillion dollars uh, for the purpose of providing capital to support Fed lending. Um, the Treasury Department, uh, statutorily, uh, has a has a substantial role in setting the terms of those of those programs. So you have the people's representatives uh, appropriating the money. You have the executive branch involved in setting the terms. Uh, and then you have the Fed uh, carrying out those, those, those terms. You have the Fed operating the facilities. I guess I'm, I'm wondering why was the Fed uh, so conservative? In the terms of the Main Street program, uh, you know, such that very few, very few loans were made. I think I think the boxes that you want checked were checked. The Treasury Department was involved. Congress was involved. Uh, there was democratic ac accountability. Um, uh, how do you how do you respond to that? Um, well, uh, so there. I mean, there there are a couple of answers. There was uh, the 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 governance structure around these thirteen three facilities is quite, uh, it, it is inherently conservative. Um, and it led for incentives, not just at the Federal Reserve, indeed, uh, you know, there was a, a lot of discussion at the Fed that we should, um, uh, you know, that we should uh, amend the terms of these facilities in order to uh, expand their uh, appeal and usefulness. Uh, but that statutory governance structure around 13.3 uh, it creates significant incentives for uh, for the relevant actors not to incur a loss. And if you're not going to incur a loss, uh, then that's going to limit the appeal in that sort of in the context that we faced in the spring of 2020 of uh, uh, of something like the Main Street Lending Facility. Uh, again, I think that that removing those ongoing decisions about, well, if we need to change the terms of these facilities, how should they be changed? Removing them from the, uh, from the central bank and from the, the governance constraints of central bank emergency lending uh, and putting them as promptly as practicable into uh, a separate governance structure that can make that decision that feels both more freedom and, and more uh, flexibility in saying, if this is the problem we're trying to solve, this is how we have to try to solve it, uh, goes a long way to addressing that. Let me ask you about uh, the supplemental leverage ratios and central bank reserves, which you which you mentioned in your uh, in your remarks as well. Um, you had mentioned that that expectations about the normalization of of, of reserves uh, did not materialize. Um, can you uh, prognosticate a little? Do you expect that when uh, the pandemic is in the rearview mirror, if we have, you know, hopefully another five or ten years of of, of, of a normal economy, do you expect uh, reserves to normalize? If so, why? If not, why not? And how might that affect uh, the SLR? Um, so that's a it, it's a very good question. It's it's uh, a puzzle that's related to. Uh, uh, some of the monetary policy issues that we're struggling with right now, too. Um, so since uh, the onset of COVID, the amount of reserves in the system has been growing dramatically. Uh, 
Uh, and a significant portion of that has been driven by the increase in the size of deposit accounts. So some of it has been driven by the Federal Reserve's own activities and by inter intermediation in the financial markets, but a significant portion has been driven by the fact that the, the cash in the financial system is simply growing and people don't have a good explanation for why that is. Um, we obviously meet regularly with the banks and you know, I certainly began, I think most people began thinking that that increase in the cash and banking accounts probably initially driven by the fiscal uh, stimulus in the spring of 2020 uh, would begin uh, uh, draining in the fall of 2020 as some of the first uh, uh, support measures began to uh, began to fall off, but it did not. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, you know the the average size of accounts across the income spectrum uh, has continued to increase uh, and increased more at the lower end of the income spectrum than at the higher end of the income sp uh, income spectrum. And we've had more financial, uh, more fiscal support since then. Maybe that's uh, partly driving it. So uh, then. I, I thought that maybe this fall, when rent moratoria uh, fell off, when some of the credit uh, card defer deferrals uh, ran off, that you'd start to see the pay down of some of these uh, uh, increased balances, all of which, which is driving some of the, the leverage issues in the banking system. And we're not. Uh, they are continuing to grow, and they're growing even more at the lower end of the income spectrum than the higher end of the income spectrum. So in the, you know, the, the lower level of deposit accounts are now eight times as large uh, as they were before COVID. Uh, at the higher end of the deposit accounts, they're uh, one and a half times as large as they were before COVID. And no one has a good, since no one has a good explanation for why that is happening and continuing to happen, it's hard to say whether we will revert to the mean. Uh, you know, as time continues uh, to go on and whether eventually, uh, you know, and, and by reverting to the mean, does that mean simply that accounts will stop growing, but that we've reached some new uh, stable level uh, with significantly higher cash in the system and therefore reserves at the Fed? Uh, or, uh, or, or will they start to shrink back down to something more like a pre-COVID level? You know, I've been expecting that for a year and a half and it hasn't, uh, it hasn't happened yet. So your uh, your answer, which I which I agree with, I uh, agree with the puzzle, and I and and I uh, agree with your emphasis on fiscal policy uh, as a potential driver of this um, uh, is very reasonable. What do you think uh, about the role of monetary policy uh, in 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 reserves? I mean, of course, the Fed's the Fed's own actions affect uh, affect the level of reserves as well. Um, do you uh, have, a, have a perspective on that? Do you think that this is something the Fed should be concerned about? Uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts on, on, on the relationship of monetary policy to this phenomenon? Yeah, I think that it is something, I, 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 I think that it is something that the Fed should be concerned about. I don't think that that should be uh, uh, the driver or even the principal driver of monetary, monetary policy decisions. We obviously have to keep in mind that our own actions are also <clears throat> uh, affecting some of these outcomes. Um, you know, I think the key driver of our monetary policy decisions have to be uh, our statutory mandates of uh, uh, you know, uh, low inflation and, and maximum employment and uh, in, in the context of, of moderate interest rates. Um, I think that our new monetary policy framework uh, is, is, some people have said, well, you know, is the current, uh, you know, the last several months of higher inflation, is that revealing some flaw <clears throat> in the framework? I, I, I don't think so. I'm one of the hockeyer folks uh, on the FOMC, and I am perfectly comfortable with how we have uh, approach the question over the last several months. The, I, I view our framework as essentially saying we will wait until we see the whites of their eyes. Uh, and over the course of the last several months, there has been, you know, there have been very plausible reasons to think, you know, in in the uh, you know last summer, for example, if you if you looked closely at the data, the drivers of kind of high increasing aggregate inflation numbers were 
were quite narrow categories of, uh, or quite narrow categories. I mean, used cars really was a principal driver, you know, in, in uh, June and July uh, of the higher aggregate inflation numbers. There were reasons to say, okay, well, you know, that'll pass. Uh, that's, you know, that's relatively anomalous. We don't, we're not gonna react for that sort of a, uh, for that sort of a factor. As the fall came, it's, you know, now there were broader issues uh, with, uh, with uh, you know, with supply and demand imbalances, but there were reasons to think that that was a supply problem, a temporary supply constraints, the bottlenecks and so forth. Um, and that those would resolve themselves and it would be appropriate for monetary policy to look through that because, you know, we, have, we would have a level of demand that productive capacity before COVID could meet. And we were just running into some delays in building back up building actual production back up to that capacity, but that would happen soon enough. And, uh, and if we constrain demand prematurely, we could sort of set the economy at too low of a level and, and fail in reaching our, our uh, maximum employment goal. Uh, as the data have continued to evolve, I think it's clear that uh, there's much more, uh, I would attach much more likelihood to the view that this is not a question of demand at pre-COVID levels uh, and supply taking a while to reach back up to that pre-COVID capacity, but rather we have sustained higher demand. Uh, and it's not, and, and this is not really solely, maybe not even primarily a bottleneck story anymore. It's a question of we've got to increase productive capacity to meet that sustained higher level of demand. Uh, and that takes time. And that is exactly what monetary policy is designed to do to prevent, you know, a sustained period of inflation from that imbalance, possibly uh, unanchoring inflation expectations if that were to last for a long period of time, and therefore we should respond uh, more quickly um, uh, to uh, to constrain that demand uh, and and allow supply and demand to uh, to come together, you know, over a longer period of time and and. Uh, with less inflation over the process. So um, I, I, again, I think that's entirely consistent with saying, we're gonna wait to see the whites of their eyes. We never said we'd let the army march over us. Uh, and so, you know, the army is upon us. And so now we'll begin to fire. So we've segued into uh, a discussion of broader economic issues and a discussion of monetary policy, which is, which is good. That's where I wanted to, to take, take the conversation. Let me let me just pick up uh, precisely where you left off. Uh, we're not going to let the army run over us and we're poised and ready to fire. The Fed is continuing to purchase mortgage backed securities at a time when housing prices are increasing by 20 percent at a time when the shelter component of the consumer price index is likely to only grow in importance uh, over the next uh, several quarter, uh, next several months over the next uh, couple of quarters. Uh, Chairman Powell, in his uh, recent testimony, um, seemed uh, to open the door to the possibility that the Fed would uh, end the taper of longer term asset purchases earlier than June. Uh, June had been widely expected. Do you uh, support an earlier end to the taper? Do you um, uh, think that it makes sense to continue purchasing? mortgage-backed securities at a time when uh, housing prices are white hot? How do you, how do you think about those issues? So uh, I certainly, given the data that we're seeing now, I, I certainly would be supportive uh, of a committee decision to uh, uh, move the end of the taper forward from where people had been expecting it uh, in June. Um, I, I myself, uh, would be uh, would have been more comfortable with uh, tapering uh, mortgage uh, back purchases faster than treasury purchases. Um, I, I do think that there are, uh, I do think that one can overstate uh, the sort of benefits of that kind of uh, uh, differential uh, taper. Uh, and so, you know, I, I didn't object strongly when that wasn't the the uh, consensus view of the committee, but uh, were the views of the committee to change, I would be uh, supportive of that differential taper. Uh, and what are your views on uh, interest rate increases in calendar year 2022? Well, yeah, obviously, uh, 
uh, since I am for at least another 15 minutes a sitting Fed governor, sitting Fed governors are uh, you know always taught uh, uh, to to uh, never uh, predict uh, an interest rate rise, but simply say we'll look at data. Uh, but I do think that it will depend uh, on how this uh, evolves. I mean, there's still you know there's still decent reason to believe uh, that inflation. Uh, over the course of the next couple of quarters will come down uh, to less stratic, uh, stratospheric levels. Uh, I, uh, I'm more skeptical of that than I was six months ago, uh, but I don't think it's clear that it won't. So I think we need to see, and uh, you know, as, as I've said publicly in other contexts, I'm perfectly comfortable with inflation running at 2.2%, 2.5% for you know, a, a, an extended period of time. If we get to next spring and inflation is still over four uh, percent, and we've ended our taper, and and that's you know that's where we are, I think the Fed, I will not be on the on the committee at that time, but I think the Fed would would have to say seriously this has run too high for too long, uh, and we need to start using other tools. So if we expect elevated inflation throughout 2022, even if we expect uh, inflation elevated at the at the two and a half percent range that you're comfortable with, I'm wondering how you uh, how you think about how that interacts with the Fed's new framework. Uh, if inflation is consistently, you know, the 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 framework seems to be designed for a world where the Fed is consistently undershooting its inflation target, which of course is where is where we we had been for 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 over a decade. Uh, if we have uh, above target inflation, uh, including some months of substantially above target inflation for uh, a year and a half, for two years. How does how does that interact with the Fed's new with the Fed's new framework? Should the Fed be trying to push inflation below the target to, to make up for that overshoot, or 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 uh, is that is that reading the the, the framework wrong? There's been a lot of ambiguity about the length of the look-back period, things of this nature. I wonder if you if you have some thoughts on that. Yeah. So um, uh, the, there's you know the the ambiguity is obviously strategic uh, in the framework, so that you could get unanimous agreement on it. Um, I uh, there are those there are those on the committee there there are those and there are Fed observers who think that the purpose of the framework is to try to fine tune inflation expectations at two, that the result of our decade of uh, mildly undershooting our 2% target was that inflation expectations were you know, getting set slightly below two. And so we'd never get up to two and we needed to do something to try to, uh, to, try to move them up to two. And that would be being willing to run uh, over two for some extended period of time, so that people said, "Oh, it's not 1.7; it's actually two." I, I, I don't know. I pay fairly close attention uh, to these issues, uh, and I don't see my expectations uh, being fi fine tunable uh, to that degree. Uh, from you know, that's something that the Fed is going to do is going to move my expectations from 1.8 to two uh, because we ran at 2.2. Uh, for two years. I just, I don't think we can do that. We can't even measure inflation precisely enough to know that 1.8 isn't two, uh, let alone that, uh, that inflation expectations ought to be moved up by two tenths of a percentage point. We can't do that. What I look at the framework as saying is that we have a uh, maximum employment mandate and we have seen, and there are conceptual reasons to believe that that's a, a durable uh, uh, a durable effect that we can uh, allow unemployment to fall to lower levels uh, than we previously would have been comfortable with uh, without immediately responding to try to cool the economy uh, and that can be done uh, without a significant increase inflation uh, and so we should give the economy a chance to demonstrate that it is in that position before we uh, preemptively respond. And for someone of my, I, I think that is technocratically justifiable, justifiable. And for someone of my political persuasion, I think the benefits that come from encouraging more people to be connected uh, with work and with the labor market than have been in the past uh, are, 
incredibly important uh, for, you know, for supporting, uh, uh, you know, a, a system in which people can, uh, can maximize the opportunities that they're capable of achieving. So, so I, I don't look at this as uh, trying to necessarily average inflation to uh, a particular point over a particular period of time. I look at it as being patient uh, in the face of what we previously would have found to be an excessively tight labor market uh, uh, in order to encourage more people uh, to be connected to that labor market, but patient only up to a point. Our other, uh, uh, our other mandate is to keep low inflation. And if we think that that's at risk, then we need to respond. And, and I think that's what you'll see the Fed doing. So let me let me ask you about the, the labor market. I, I I think what I hear you saying is that uh, you would be uh, happy to tolerate uh, moderately higher inflation if that meant driving the unemployment rate uh, marginally lower. And and that's that's my view as well. And 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 was my view uh, prior to the pandemic. Um, I am growing increasingly concerned that workforce participation rates are not going to recover to their February of 2020 level uh, for uh, workers age 20 to 24, workers age 25 to 54, workers uh, 55 plus. You see for all three of those groups that workforce participation rates haven't recovered uh, to their pre-pandemic level. The overall participation rate uh, really hasn't shown much improvement since the summer of 2020 after lockdowns were lifted. Um, if you had asked me six months ago, I would have told you the Fed shouldn't give up on the goal of uh, a full recovery of uh, employment rates, a full recovery of workforce participation uh, back to pre-pandemic uh, levels. Uh, I would no longer advise the Fed to, to follow that course. How do you think about the labor market? Where are we? Should we expect a full recovery of uh, employment and participation? So um, I think it's premature to say that in some of the younger cohorts, we can't get back to the, uh, to the labor force participation rates that we saw pre-COVID. The overall labor force participation rate, um, I don't think that we uh, need to or can make a fetish of seeing that return to uh, pre-COVID levels because we all know that you know, although in the very strong economy, uh, you know, leading into the spring of 2020, it had begun to edge up somewhat. That was pushing against, you know, the secular pressures of the baby boom retirements that, uh, you know, that have continued and to some degree been accelerated during COVID uh, that will drive that labor force participation rate lower. Um, and that's just, you know, th that's just how it's going to be. So I've never believed that in saying, you know, that we, you know, that we want to see a, uh, uh, a return to a strong labor market, but that means we've got to see a return to the pre-COVID labor force participation rate. I think we have to look at a range of measures of, uh, of labor market strength. Uh, and I think if you look at that range of labor measures, uh, you know, we have a pretty healthy labor market currently, um, and that can justify, again, our beginning to withdraw accommodation. Uh, let me ask you uh, a question that relates back to your speech. You expressed concern about the Fed lending to the real economy because governance issues with those lending facilities could put at risk Fed independence. I think that's a, a very valid concern. Some of your colleagues on the Federal Open Market Committee have uh, been publicly discussing uh, the need for the Fed to take into account a changing climate. Uh, in uh, monetary policy and regulatory issues, uh, the need uh, of the Fed to account for uh, issues of, of racial equity in uh, monetary policy decisions. Uh, these are, uh, of course, very political uh, issues. And uh, under uh, Chairman Powell's uh, predecessor, uh, Chair Yellen, you saw the Fed start to talk about uh, income inequality in a way that it hadn't before, and, and that was also a very uh, uh, interpreted in some in some parts of Washington as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as as broaching on political territory, putting at risk the Fed's independence. Do you think this this new emphasis uh, or this emphasis from some on inequality, on uh, racial equity, on uh, climate issues, does that 
does that threaten Fed, Fed independence? Do you have a perspective on, on that? Um, well, I think it depends on how the Fed approaches those issues. So for example, as a re, you know, in the context of bank regulation, I think that it is meet and right for uh, the Federal Reserve to consider uh, how the evolution of the climate might affect, and, and not just the evolution of the climate, but uh, risks from potential political responses to perceived evolution of the climate might uh, affect the, uh, uh, the bankability of bank customers, the performance of bank assets. Now, my own view is that if you, given the long evolution of, um, uh, you know, of, of climate, that and the relatively short uh, exposures that the banking system has uh, to economic activity at any particular moment, that that will largely take care of itself. Uh, um, you know, as as particular firms become less bankable uh, over time, they will be less banked um, uh, without uh, draconian uh, regulatory uh, intervention. But that's the sort of thing we should be looking at. Um, but we should be looking at it from the point of view of the preservation of the stability of the financial system, not from seeking to put our thumb or even heavy fist on one side of the scale or the other. Um, uh, with respect to questions uh, you know, such as the you know, uh, inequality, uh, uh, you know, I, I think that the main thing that the Fed can do, I think the Fed can Fed actions can affect that. We've seen that they can affect that, uh, which is one of the reasons for our new framework. We saw that when we allowed uh, unemployment to fall to lower levels than we sort of had previously all accepted were, uh, were, would be inflation accelerating, uh, but that particularly benefited those on the, uh, in the lower income cohorts uh, by giving them jobs and those tended to be uh, those also tended to be predominantly minorities uh, in those lower income cohorts, and that was uh, and that was a benefit. I don't think that we can, uh, but that was a benefit of a generally applicable policy uh, that we were pursuing. Uh, you know that had you know that had large macro benefits uh, and these uh, these ancillary sort of micro benefits. I. I, I don't think that if we were to try to devise policies that were centered uh, in the uh, uh, in the jargon on uh, inequality as opposed to macroeconomic performance, uh, I think we'd end up with pathologies and the politicization of the Fed, uh, lots of controversy around what we were doing. Uh, I think that we can do quite a bit uh, by using the sorts of tools that we've used to address those up to now. Uh, we are over time. Let me thank uh, everybody uh, for tuning into the live stream. Uh, let me apologize to the people whose questions we weren't able to get to. Uh, allow me to thank everyone who will be watching uh, uh, this uh, as a video at their at their convenience. Uh, thanks especially to you, Governor Quarles, for uh, presenting your remarks uh, and uh, for taking uh, taking questions uh, and for your for your thoughtfulness and your candor. Uh, thank you for your service on the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System and uh, best wishes for your next chapter, whatever that may be. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Great pleasure.